Hello and welcome. Welcome to this event um, sponsored by the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning. My name is John Merkel and I have the pleasure of directing the J. Phillips Center. And I'm really delighted tonight, or late, still afternoon, that um, we're co-sponsoring this event with two Turkish organizations from the Twin Cities. And that's because, as you will learn, uh, and maybe you've already been introduced to this uh, before coming, that the person who inspired the movement that our distinguished uh, guest, John Paul, is his name, yes, John Paul, P-A-H-L, J-O-N, P-A-H-L, and no numbers, <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, um, that uh, he, he, uh, the, he'll be focusing on a movement that's been inspired by Fethullah Gulen, who is perhaps one of the most, well, he is one of the most influential Muslim scholars in the world. He's a Turkish Muslim, you're gonna learn, he's living in exile in Pennsylvania because of the Turkish government uh, that uh, is not happy with him, and you'll find about, all, about, all about that. But um, so it was actually my friend Tolga Mizerli. Tolga, stand up. Yeah. Tolga is a close friend, and Tolga and I have worked together in interfaith dialogue both here and in the CSB and SJU community. Tolga, you've been up here three or four times at least, more than that, actually, for events, and some of which you were involved in. And we've worked together in the cities on, on events. And Tolga, uh, gave me a call in the fall and uh, said that he was bringing Dr. Paul to the Twin Cities in uh, you know this first well the first week of March and wanted to know if we would uh, sponsor an event up here and knowing Tolga's dis discernment and uh, and then learning about Dr. Paul and of course knowing Gulen and the Gulen movement. I said yes. I mean, Gulen is one of the, is one of the most influential Muslim scholars in the world, if not the most influential, at least for millions of people. And Dr. Paul has written um, a masterful biography of Gulen, and so this was a, this was great for our interfaith center. And so Tolga is actually the director of those two Turkish uh, those two Turkish organizations, the Niagara Foundation of Minnesota which is a movement, a hizmet movement. Hizmet, you'll find out all about that. It has to do with Gulen. And he also directs the Turkish American Society of Minnesota. So thanks again to you, Tolga. And um, so when uh, Dr. Paul accepted the invitation, he told me that he was delighted to come not only to speak uh, to the St. Ben St. John's community, but he was delighted particularly because uh, Jennifer Bestie and Noreen Hersfeld were colleagues here. And he said, uh, he told me that Jennifer, Jennifer hadn't known that I was inviting him. And um, he said that uh, Jennifer had been a student of his at Valparaiso and he told me that he had met Noreen uh, years ago and he was looking forward to being with both of them. So thanks to you two as well. Um, so um, today's event is um, titled Fatula Gulen's Gandhi Inspired. So that makes it even further interfaith, right? Gandhi was a Hindu. Uh, so Fatula Gulen's Gandhi Inspired Muslim Peace Movement. And because Jennifer uh, goes back to her college days with Dr. Paul, um, I have asked her to do the introduction. It is an honor this afternoon to introduce our speaker. John Paul earned his PhD at the University of Chicago, and he holds the Peter Paul and Elizabeth Hagen Chair at United Lutheran Seminary in Pennsylvania, where he is professor of the history of Christianity. Dr. Paul is the author of seven books, including Empire of Sacrifice, The Religious Origins of American Violence, and most recently, Fetullah Gulen, A Life of Hizmet, 
Why a Muslim Scholar in Pennsylvania Matters to the World. Dr. Paul's current research continues to focus on religion, violence, and peace growing. He has a project underway entitled A Coming Religious Peace, telling the largely untold story of the dramatic emergence of religious peace work around the globe, including in the United States. In recent years, he has been particularly active in anti-racist initiatives, leading congregations and communities in repentance, reckoning, and reconciliation. Not only is John Paul a highly accomplished scholar, but he is the most talented teacher and loyal mentor I have ever encountered. On my first day as a first year at Valparaiso, I entered my Theo 100 class and I met Dr. John Paul. I remember our classes were three hours straight in the mornings from eight to 11 or till 12. And I had to, he, he would have this intense low voice and I would have to strain and concentrate with all my might to take in everything he was saying. Um, and I'll just never forget that it was exhilarating and it was like 10 minutes would go by and then it was all over. Um, so I just, I'll never forget that. Um, and I just wanna thank John Merkel for having the brilliance to bring John Paul to campus so that we can engage him as our community. And I'm also thankful to John Merkel because my own Theo 100 students will have a chance to talk to John Paul in our classes tomorrow. So please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Good evening. It is uh, truly my honor and delight to be here. And I want to begin by acknowledging that the Ojibwa and Dakota are the original caretakers of this land. Uh, and I thank them for um, our ancestors uh, who did care for this land and pledge uh, to continue and accelerate our care for the land to repair the damage that uh, we have done. My deep thanks to professors John Merkel and my dear friend Jennifer Bestie for inviting me to be with you and to, for the warm welcome I have received so far. It's truly great to see Jennifer and her husband Steve again. I preached at their wedding a few seasons ago. <laughs> and to prepare the homily, I asked them four personal questions that I then wove into the sermon. <clears throat> How they met, their best time together, their worst time together, and an image or metaphor to describe their love for each other. <clears throat> you can ask Dr. Bestie her answers to those questions afterwards if you would like. I wonder if she remembers what she said. As she indicated, I've known Jennifer since the first semester of her freshman year at Valparaiso University, where I taught at the time, and it was never in doubt to me that she was going to do great things. She was intense, constantly questioning, inquiring, earnest. I remember especially the first time we read Kant's Grounding for a Metaphysics of Morals in a freshman seminar. Jennifer could not let it go. She was smitten with theology, philosophy, and ethics. The person you know as Dr. Bestie graduated from Valparaiso in three years with a double major in biology slash pre-med and theology. And I remember vividly sitting, um, as she sat in my office and asked me, should I go to medical school or graduate school to study theology? Jennifer, I said, we really need doctors who are also trained in the humanities. And you know how that turned out. She blithely ignored my vocational advice and went to Vanderbilt to study theology, and here we are this afternoon. I have to say, I am exceptionally proud of her and the really vital and important work uh, that she is doing as a scholar. So please join me in thanking my students for the work that she does. <clears throat> no, it's true. It's my honor and privilege to be here with you this afternoon to speak about Fethullah Gulen and Mohandas Gandhi, Hizmet and Ahimsa, Convergences, Convergences and Growing Deep Peace. So I've changed the title, John, just to 
pad. I hope that's okay. And thank you to each of you for uh, being here this evening. I want to begin in what might seem a slightly strange way by confessing that I love potatoes. One of my earliest memories, in fact, <clears throat> is of helping my parents harvest potatoes with pitchforks and a wooden wheelbarrow in late summer at my great-grandparents Oscar and Hilda Olson's farm in northeastern Wisconsin, near where I grew up. I remember the smell of my great-grandparents' root cellar in particular, into which we wheeled loads of potatoes to be stored that would eventually make lefsa or mashed potatoes or boiled, baked, roasted, buttered, and parsley potatoes, served with every meal. And now that I'm once again living in Wisconsin, where we've resided near my extended family for the past five years while I teach online or intensive classes back in Philly, I grow potatoes in my own garden. Yukon Golds, Norland Reds, Russets, yummy. I confess this strange love because potatoes will link together, in at least an amusing initial way, my two subjects for tonight, the well-known peace activist known as the Great One, the Mahatma Gandhi, and the lesser known but no less interesting individual, I hope you will come to learn with me by the end of my talk, M. Fethullah Gulen. They don't share everything as peace activists. Gandhi, <clears throat> one worked in South Africa and India in the first half of the 20th century. Gandhi was murdered in 1948. And the other worked in Turkey in the second half of the 1900s. And since 1999, as John mentioned, Yulin has been, lived in exile in the US, but with continuing influence across global contexts down to today. I've intuited a relationship between Gandhi and Gulen since I began my research to write the first critical biography of Gulen in English, which was published in 2019. But at John's invitation um, and the conversations I've had with him allowed me to explore the correlation between the two in a disciplined way. So John, thank you for that. I hope you enjoy learning along with me what I've discovered, a rather clear link, or rather a set of links between Gandhi and Gulen at the intersection of Ahimsa, Gandhi's principle of nonviolence, and Hizmet, which is the Turkish word for service, and the name given to the community and movement which Gulen has inspired. And it all begins with potatoes. Sometime in the late 1970s, according to Irfan Yilmaz, an Istanbul businessman, Gulen, whom they call Hoja Fendi, honored teacher, cooked a meal for a group of people close to him. The meal took place at Yilmaz's home in Istanbul. And Gulen's menu went like this. Potato soup, meat with potato, potato salad, potato kofta, think meatballs with, you guessed it, potatoes and spices. And for dessert, I'll let Yilmaz's words tell the rest. Quote, I suspected from the courses before that it had to be a potato dish, but I couldn't taste it. One of our friends asked Yulen, this dessert is really nice, what is it? And then I jumped in and asked, is this a potato dessert? And Hoja Fendi said, yes, it is. We peeled one big sack of potatoes. Today, he went on, is the meal of Gandhi. Gandhi, Yulen explained, used to cook in one type, simply. Born in 1938 in a very poor village in northeastern Turkey, throughout his life, Fethullah Gulen has sought and lived a life of simplicity. He's never married, never owned property, and he currently resides in a two-room apartment in a retreat center in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. His bedroom that I have visited <clears throat> features a single bed and small dresser. His office sitting room has a modest, for a scholar who's published over 60 books, library, and dozens of small jars of soil from the various places that he has preached over the course of his life, mostly in Turkey, but also in Australia, Europe, and the United States. Yulen is also an ardent advocate for the Muslim observance of fasting during Ramadan. And he teaches that the fast is a practice in living simply so that others may simply live. Gandhi, as is well known, also lived simply. In fact, he may have coined the phrase I quoted from Gulen above. Once he settled in India as an adult, Gandhi lived in an ashram, an intentional community dedicated to non-mechanized lifestyle gathered around study, prayer, and activism. He also, of course, fasted. 
famously in hunger strikes to protest South African apartheid and the ruthless British Raj, but also as practices of discipline, which is the root meaning of the word yoga, discipline to focus his own spiritual life. I'm not familiar if he ever cooked with potatoes, but that he emphasized eating simply as a vegetarian is unquestionable. So we're often running and finding correlations, and not, if not influence, between these two spiritual thinkers, Gandhi and Gulen. An affinity between the two became apparent to me early in my research, which began in 2010. And yet when I suggested it to Bakir Aksoy, one of Gulen's longest standing associates, Aksoy stopped me immediately, no. Aksoy said, Gulen is not resisting anything like Gandhi did. He's not a political thinker. He's not trying to overthrow an empire. I remember the moment vividly. It was in the living room of my, of my home in Philadelphia, probably in 2012. To differentiate Gandhi from Gulen is important in this way, given that Gulen has been slandered as a terrorist by the Turkish government since 2016. I use the term slander intentionally. I've studied Gulen and the Hizmet community now for a dozen years, and I have found zero evidence, zero, that he harbored any political ambitions, much less desired to overthrow the government. I've studied and interviewed Gulen's critics as well as friends of the man, and I have observed the increasingly dictatorial behavior of the current Turkish regime. The evidence is plain to me. The accusation by the Turkish regime that Gulen is a terrorist is an example of a propagandistic big lie of which there are too many circulating in recent years on the global stage. So Bakir Aksoy's caution stands. Gulen's life was politicized for him. He did not agree with Gandhi that all religion is political, as the Mahatma put it. And yet, <clears throat> one of Gulen's central teachings is in Turkish, muspet hareket, consistent, positive action or patient and sincere practice of Islam, prayer, charity, fasting, pilgrimage, and so forth. It is this muspet hareket that constitutes the life of a person of hizmet, the person of service. Gulen puts it like this, and I quote, we must be as if handless to those who hit us, tongueless to those who curse us. Even if they try to fracture us into pieces, still we are going to remain unbroken and embrace everyone with love and compassion." End quote. And if you're still with me, which I certainly hope you are because I'm still in my introduction, you may notice that Gulen's description of Muspet Hadakat sounds an awful lot like Gandhi's description of Ahimsa which usually gets translated as nonviolence. Himsa in Sanskrit means the desire to kill. So ahimsa, literally, is the opposite of the desire to kill, hence nonviolence. But Gandhi goes on. Ahimsa means, and I quote, you may not offend anybody. You may not harbor uncharitable thought, even in connection with those you consider your enemies. To one who follows this doctrine, there are no enemies. If you express your love, ahimsa, in such a manner that it impresses itself indelibly, indelibly upon your so-called enemy, they must return that love. And that requires far greater courage than delivering of blows." End quote. And so, while Gandhi and Gulen differed in context and strategies, there are some definite correlations, affinities, or harmonies between them as we shall discover. I'll track for you the resonances in how they sought to grow peace in three sections. A first one entitled, A Resignation to God as Truth, Truth as God. Once more, Resignation to God as Truth, Truth as God. Second, <clears throat> An Ethic of Love serving all the living. And third uh, section entitled, Growing Deep Peace, Fostering Trust Through Education, Prayer, Engaged Empathy, Principled Pluralism, 
and social enterprise. In my conclusion, I'll offer a word of hope that although so-called strongmen appear to rule the world, the bad guys truly do seem to be winning. In fact, there's a deeper trajectory in history and especially on the margins that pulls us toward and makes manifest a more cooperative, compassionate, peaceful future, one that both Gandhi and Yulen envisioned. I'll talk for another 40 minutes or so and then probably have to summarize what is a fairly closely reasoned um, essay. Thank you again, John, for the opportunity to put it together. Um, ending with my hopeful, again, conclusion, and then look forward to some questions and conversation. Sound good? Can I get an amen? Thank you. All right, <clears throat> let me get my water. <clears throat> and not bring the entire podium along with me. Thank you. So, resignation to God as truth, truth as God. Central to the life and work of um, Gandhi was not only a commitment to ahimsa, nonviolence, but also a commitment to another Sanskrit term, satyagraha, which is often translated truth force, soul force, or the force that is generated through adherence to truth. Here's one of Gandhi's description of what satyagraha is all about, and I quote, Satyagraha is not physical force. A satyagrahi does not inflict pain on the adversary. They do not seek destruction. A satyagrahi never resorts to firearms. Satyagraha is pure soul force. Truth, which is the word satya in Sanskrit, truth is the very substance of the soul. This is why this force is called satyagraha. The soul is informed with knowledge. In it burns the flame of love. If someone gives us pain through ignorance, we shall win them through love." End quote. Historically, as you can discover by watching the excellent 1982 film of his life starring Ben Kingsley, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture and has actually held up quite well over the decades, Gandhi put satyagraha into practice by engaging individuals in civil disobedience to unjust laws on the people of India by the British Raj. Most famously, perhaps, in 1930, he led a multitude of people in a march to the sea where they harvested natural salt from the ocean to protest a law that required Indian people to buy British salt and hence enrich British corporate coffers. Facing punishment for this crime of producing local salt, and other similar mass actions, Gandhi demonstrated the power of people to defy oppressive laws and to set the terms for their own society. And it worked. Using no weapons but satyagraha and ahimsa, Gandhi helped end the British occupation of India and bring about what is now the world's most populous democracy. Satyagraha worked, Gandhi contended, because truth force was how we operate ordinarily most of the time in everyday life. We trust each other to tell the truth. He wrote, quote, history is really a record of every interruption of the even working of the force of soul or love. Two brothers quarrel. One of them repents and reawakens the love that was lying dormant in him the two begin to live together in peace. Nobody takes note of this. But if the two brothers take up arms, their doings would be immediately reported in the press. And what is true of families is true of nations. History, then, is a record of an interruption of the course of nature. Soul force being natural is not noted in history." End quote. This is why my book, The Coming Religious Peace, seems so counterintuitive. Because nobody knows the story of the truth force, soul force movements that have happened around the globe, time after time after time after time. Gandhi's point is an obvious one, but easy to miss. Ordinarily, every day, each moment, we trust that people will act trustworthily, that they'll stop at red lights, that they'll take their turn in line at the grocery store, and so on. And yet for Gandhi, Satyagraha was not only and not primarily a political strategy or a social fact, it was also a theological conviction. I can live, Gandhi wrote, 
quote, only by having faith in God. My definition of God must always be kept in mind. For me, there is no other God than truth. Truth is God, end quote. So Satyagraha, truth force, was for Gandhi God's power in action. Truth and trustworthiness is how God acts through people. My religion, Gandhi wrote, begins and ends with truth and nonviolence. As a Hindu, Gandhi found Satyagraha at the heart of the Bhagavad Gita, no doubt the most revered sacred book among the many in the Hindu tradition. As is well known, the Gita begins, you should read it if you haven't, with an impending battle between, uh, that paralyzes the warrior Arjuna, whose charioteer Krishna is an incarnation of God, and Krishna urges him, Arjuna, to fight. And yet in Gandhi's reading, he wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, the entire scenario is a metaphor. The battlefield is life. And the weapons to be used by Arjuna are the yogas. And those yogas of karma, yanana, and bhakti all resolve in the end to satyagraha, to soul force, to God's power. We are to fight in life through the yogas of action, knowledge, and devotion. And indeed, one discovers through the practices of those yogas one's destiny, one's dharma, one's duty. So, fight. For Fatula Gilen, the doctrine is at, that is at the heart of his teaching would seem to be the opposite of Gandhi's. The term is riza, usually translated as resignation, but meaning much more. Yulen study as a youth with several Sufi teachers. Sufism is the spiritual path within Islam which cuts across both Sunni and Shia communities. And for Sufis, riza means to accept actively what God destines. Since God is all aware, God knows what people do, and God desires people to respond to God with acts that are pleasing to God. Acts of justice and mercy, of worship, acts filled with goodness, beauty, and truth. God then takes pleasure in people through these acts, and people in turn find pleasure in pleasing God. Riza means finally then living for God's pleasure. Yulin writes, one can have no greater, quote, one can have no greater reward or higher rank than God's being pleased with him or her, which is only attainable by personal resignation to what God has decreed. As the greatest rank in God's sight, resignation to God's pleasure is a final target that's been sought by the greatest members of humanity from the glory of creation, Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace and blessings, to all the other prophet saints and purified scholars who passed the final test through sincerity, certainty, reliance, surrender, and confidence. They have surmounted many difficulties and obstacles and bore many unendurable sufferings and torments. Riza, in other words, is a way to fight, too. In his own life, Gilan has experienced more than his share of difficulties and obstacles, sufferings, and torments, and not only recently. Between 1960 and 99, Gilan's most active years in public life, Turkey experienced four brutal military coups. After each coup, Gilan was arrested and taken to prison, charged with being a threat to the official secularism of the Turkish state. And each time, Gilan was eventually exonerated after no evidence could be found of any nefarious activities. Throughout his life, Gilan preached openly, drawing massive crowds. His popularity made him a threat to a fragile state. He was not an advocate of what came to be known as political Islam. He has never endorsed a party or a candidate. What Riza became through his preaching and teaching is his met. Voluntary service in what sociologist Mohammed Jatin has dubbed civil Islam. Within his bet, this voluntary service or civil Islam following from the desire to please God led to three ambitious initiatives that over just a few short decades grew into a global movement. This is part of what drew me to this study was how rapidly this nonviolent movement grew all over the globe, 130 different countries. First goal, activity to end ignorance through education. Second, 
to end poverty through the generation of wealth that served the common good. Third, to end violence and conflict through interreligious dialogue and through agencies that promote mutual understanding and respect. And these are the activities of terrorists. Over time, on that first initiative, people inspired by Gulen built hundreds of schools, especially math and science academies in more than 130 different nations. Gulen inspired schools in Turkey regularly sent their graduates to the most prestigious universities in the country, and a similar pattern held in Gulen-related schools wherever they were built. I'll say more about that later, as time permits. The second initiative, Wealth Generations for the Common Good, businesses begun by people inspired by Gulen's teaching of RISA covered the gamut of socially responsible enterprises, real estate and construction, a banking network incorporating Islamic principles of finance, became the largest single Islamically inspired bank in Turkey, uh, Bank Asya, a disaster relief agency, Kim Siyok Mu, now called Embrace Relief, Newspapers and magazines, Zaman, the largest circulating newspaper in Turkey until it was shut down, Sizinta, magazine, on the relation between science and religion, radio and television networks, Semenyolo, hospitals and clinics, Shifa, and countless small businesses. People of Hizmet worked as furniture makers, ceramic shapers, baklava bakers. And an interreligious dialogue, their third initiative, People inspired to Hizmet as an expression of their desire to please God organized think tanks, the Journalists and Writers Foundation, and public conferences on social concerns such as poverty, human rights, and gender equality. Most notably, since this is how I first became aware of Fatula Gulen at an event in Philadelphia in 2006, I'd never heard of him before. People of Hizmet sponsored iftar dinners to break the Ramadan fast. Within Turkey, these iftar dinners brought together diverse, often conflicting segments of Turkish society, and the same became true of the iftar dinners held in any country where people of Hizmet took up residence. It's not too strong to say that people inspired by Gulen transformed Turkish civil society as fully as Gandhi reshaped India, and utterly without violence. There was a reason Barack Obama chose to make his first official state visit to Turkey in 2008. Hizmet gave hope that a Muslim-inspired democracy with a robust civil society was really taking root in the Middle East. Alas, by 2012, it had begun to fall apart. Gulen consistently preached nonviolence, but people inspired by him did serve in the military and in other positions in government, such as the police and justice system. Remember, this is entirely a voluntary community. Yulen's teaching on war and peace was akin to the Christian doctrine of just war. Any act of violence was justifiable only by a legitimate authority in self-defense and in proportionate means to restore peace. His commitment to the rule of law and democracy was absolute. He had experienced firsthand the trauma of arbitrary military rule. Beginning in 2012, then, police and judges, some of them people of his met, sponsored investigations and raids that exposed corruption in circles close to the president of Turkey and his family, who had just completed building a palace for themselves with 1,100 rooms. And instead of allowing the corruption proceedings to continue, the government targeted the police and judges. The government claimed these civil servants were part of a deep State. Sound familiar? In time, and accelerating after 2016, anyone at all associated with Gulen was labeled by the government as part of a terrorist conspiracy to overthrow the government, the Fatula Terrorist Organization, or FETO, was the acronym used. Thousands of police, judges, military officers and soldiers, journalists, teachers, and other civil servants were summarily fired or imprisoned, often on the thinnest pretexts. How many know any of this? Three, four, five. <clears throat> the government of Turkey, increasingly beholden to a kleptocratic version of political Islam, scapegoated Gulen and people of Hizmet. Recall, they don't hit back. 
and began seizing the assets associated with the schools, agencies, and networks that people inspired by Gulen had built. And this big lie worked for reasons I can explain in discussion as time permits, leading to a series of human rights violations that continue because the witch hunt is still going on in Turkey and around the globe as well. At the time I completed the biography in 2019, the Turkish government had seized roughly 18 billion, B, billion, from individuals inspired by Gulen or accused of being close to him. Most of those assets have been redistributed to various trusts or foundations to cronies of the ruling family. That number has undoubtedly grown, perhaps by as much as double. Newspapers, construction companies, schools, television networks, relief agencies, all closed, assets seized, employees fired, individuals blackballed from other means of employment. Since 2016, people of his men who had the means to do so have fled the country as refugees seeking asylum, many of them under horrific circumstances. Others are in jail on charges of terrorism for serving as journalists, doctors, lawyers, scientists, bakers, taxi drivers, historians, theologians, an entire community dedicated to pleasing God, effectively purged from Turkey. So Gulen and Gandhi have shared in suffering for Ahimsa and Hizmet. Gandhi, of course, suffered in 1947 the partition of Muslim-majority Pakistan from Hindu-majority India, a development that grieved him deeply. And then on January 30, 1948, Gandhi was assassinated by a Hindu nationalist who thought Gandhi was too soft on Muslims. Yulen has experienced exile in the U.S. since 99 and now endures the suffering of people close to him at the hands of a ruthless dictator, a development that grieves him deeply. I saw him last in November. He is very frail. And yet, just as Gandhi's commitment to Satyagraha was unwavering, Yulen continues to teach Muspet Hareket and Riza, counseling people inspired by him to consistent positive action in the ways of peace and to do everything for the pleasure of God. Power resides in truth. Yulen frequently counsels in a direct evocation of Gandhi's Satyagraha, which of course has inspired countless movements for greater justice, and peace around the globe, including, of course, the civil rights movement here in the United States. One of Martin Luther King Jr.'s teachers, Howard Thurman, visited Gandhi in his ashram. And while there's no way to predict the future, I'm only a modest historian after all, his met has now taken root globally in societies as diverse as Indonesia, Australia, Nigeria, Norway, Tanzania, Belgium, South Africa, Egypt, Pakistan, and here in the United States. Thank you, Tolga. So, <clears throat> part two, and I think I'm going to summarize part two and part three and then jump to my conclusion so we can talk. Jennifer can tell you I really don't like lecturing. I much prefer dialogue as a way of uh, communicating, so I think I can um, go through my main points in a way that uh, will give us plenty of time for conversation before dinner, fair enough. <clears throat> so an ethic of, of love serving all the living. Uh, Gandhi is really deeply informed by the poet Rumi. How many have read Rumi? Best-selling poet in the United States, actually. Per 13th century Persian love poem, and I quote here from, uh, or I quote here his um, poem, I Belong to the Beloved, perhaps his most famous. If you get a chance, just Google it. It's truly a beautiful um, poem. And then Gulen, um, uh, very first lines of his most accessible book, uh, Toward a Global Civilization of Love and Tolerance, um, writes, uh, love is the most essential element of every being. It's the most radiant light. Love is the greatest power able to resist and overcome all else. He goes on, following in the Rumi tradition and interpreting Rumi and his emphasis on love. I then, <clears throat> leaning especially on uh, Gulen's uh, teachings, talk about how he puts this uh, ethic of love into practice in three ways. The first is through describing what jihad means. Um, there are two understandings of jihad in Islam. The lesser jihad is the one that uh, gets associated with war. 
but there are very strict rules for how that kind of jihad gets put into place, very much like the just war theory in Christianity. But the greater jihad, according to Glenn, is to lose one's ego, is the struggle, which is what the word jihad means, to get the ego out of the way so that we can love one another, right? Which is very much um, like um, Gandhi's teaching of satyagraha and truth force. Um, second way Gulen puts this into practice is um, through forgiveness, emphasizing forgiveness as the highest aspect of Muslim life and uh, living for uh, the pleasure of God. Um, and the third way he puts this into practice is through a, uh, what I call a non-dualist or non-binary way of living beyond us, them um, dichotomies. And the way he puts this into practice, especially is in how religion and science relate. He experienced in his own um, theological education an absence of scientific education, and therefore he's really emphasized the metaphor he uses is that people need to fly with two wings, holding together religion and science, spirituality and rationality um, together, right? No conflict, no warfare between them. Um, and it, that gets applied in all kinds of really interesting and dynamic ways uh, to society. Uh, Gandhi's diagnosis was similar to Gulen's, was a little harsher, I think, actually. Um, he saw the materialist economic uh, world of both capitalist and socialist cultures really ruthless and therefore sought to um, escape into village life and the non-mechanized lifestyle. Um, and yet um, emphasizes also that we have to struggle to lose the ego and the phrase he uses, we need to learn to identify ourselves with all that lives. And we can only do that when we get ourselves out of the way. Right. So um, that's part two of the paper. All right. And if, if you'd like, if you're interested, I'd be happy to send it to you. You can find my email address uh, easily enough. If you want to read the whole thing, I'd be happy to pass it along. <coughs> Third section, then, I'll also summarize before going to the conclusion, is entitled Growing Deep Peace, Fostering Trust Through Education, Prayer, Engaged Empathy, Principled Pluralism, and Social Enterprises. And this phrase, deep peace, is how I describe um, that just as there are different kinds of violence in the world, there's criminal violence, there's institutionalized violence in the police and in the military, in legitimized violence. There's also social and economic violence. And there's cultural violence. Words kill, right? Um, so too are there different kinds of peace. There's what I call basic peace, which is actually the flower of peace growing. I talk about the peace growing gardener. Garden, I'm a gardener, you know, so you use the metaphors you know. And I think gardening or, or cultivating peace mean, makes a lot more sense than building peace, which is often how it gets described. That's too static and not organic enough for how trust grows between people. So basic peace is the flower, and basic peace is what's often called in peace studies negative peace or the absence of war. That's the least a society should provide for people, a state should provide, the absence of war. Beyond that is what I call policy peace, which is the equivalent of social and economic violence, only when water, health care, food, housing is arranged in a way that is equitable and available to people, fairly, harmoniously. Right? That's policy peace. So how together we organize societies to generate uh, the capacity to flourish, which is all peace is. Peace is not some kumbaya thing, you know, it's, it's, it's just that. The capacity to flourish, to grow, right? Um, and then deep peace, though, is the deepest source of this capacity to flourish. And it's found in the quotidian relations of everyday life, in friendship, in love, between one another, in caring for the planet, in all of those acts of service that grow trust. Because trust is the glue that binds societies together and that will bring us greater peace. And trust is built through our religious traditions where character and courage is fostered 
through nonviolent practices like prayer, right? Because prayer changes our brain. Prayer makes us more sociable. So does pilgrimage and all the other practices associated with religious traditions. And if you want to know, you know, neuroscientists are studying this. They're doing functional MRIs on Buddhist monks as they meditate. And what happens is the animal brain, the lizard brain, calms. And the cortex grows. Those capacities of the brain to pay attention, to feel compassion, to identify with others. This is what our religions do for us and why they've been around for millennia rather than like nation states, you know, 1776, well, to hell with that. That's, you know, just a blip in the historical record compared to 5,000 years of Hinduism. Anyway, deep peace is what Gandhi and Gulen taught and practiced. And that is a peace that surpasses understanding and that nobody can take away from you ever, no matter what. Whatever the external circumstances are, that feeling of deep peace, that knowing that you are loved, no one can take that away from you. And it's an incredible source of courage and strength and resilience and health. All right, and then I, in this section of the paper, I trace how Guilin and Gandhi Develop deep peace through five um, practices of growing deep peace. Education, focusing on literacy. Because once you learn to learn, no one can ever take that away from you either. And then Gandhi says, <laughs> learning is a deep, deep joy. I've certainly found that to be true, and I hope you have too. Unfortunately, often our educational system beats it out of us. But education. Literacy, the joy of learning as a source of deep peace. Second, um, the nonviolent practices associated with religious traditions, and again, I mentioned this prayer, pilgrimage, charitable giving, music, veneration of icons. You know, I'm a jazz musician. I'm going to be teaching a class this June on uh, jazz and blues in American religious history, fo focusing on how jazz and blues have built community and fostered the common good. How many have seen Questlove's Summer of Soul? <laughs> I cried through the whole thing. And you know, if you haven't seen it, see it, right? Because it, it points to this religious and spiritual power of music um, as well, which of course our religious traditions in various forms all develop. Third then is what I called engaged empathy. Engaged empathy, Gulen was known as the crying hoja. Um, because he would often break into tears in the midst of a talk, and then other people in the, um, in the mosque would also start crying as well, and so you would have this whole community of people at prayer in tears, sobbing, right? When I first heard this, I thought, well, that's weird, you know? This could be toxic, could be manipulative, what's going on here? But the more I studied and talked to people about it, I realized that Guilain was expressing his feeling of the suffering, first of Muslims, who he says have often fallen, fallen behind the rest of the world in scientific literacy and other areas, and technology and so on, and democracy, um, and, but also for other you know, people who suffer. As the Buddha says, the first noble truth, life is suffering. Each of us will experience and encounter this suffering, right? And Gulen, through his tears, was expressing this. And other people were expressing it and feeling it at the same time in this you know, rigidly repressive and patriarchal Turkish culture where men did not cry in public. And here you have this entire, you know, it was, it was pretty amazing how it happened. But he didn't just leave that feeling alone, but he took that and engaged it in these practical activities of education, eliminating poverty through wealth generation, and um, interreligious dialogue. <coughs> And Gandhi, of course, is Satyagraha, you know, same kind of engaged empathy, recognition of the suffering of the Shudra, the outcast, the lowest caste in India's, in Hindus, you know, rigidly hierarchical caste system. He got rid of that. Fourth, or, or fought against that in his own work. Deep peace grows as people um, practice what I call principled pluralism. Principled pluralism. Gandhi was a Hindu. And that he learned from Tolstoy, a Christian, and he invited Muslims. He wanted to build peace between Hindus and Muslims in India, of course, and that's why he was so crushed when the partition happened in 1947, creating a, essentially a Hindu state and a Muslim state in India and Pakistan. For Gulen, the term here um, 
in his um, principal pluralism. He's clearly a Muslim, right? But he works with anybody. And he encourages his friends, people inspired by him, to work with anybody. Jews, Christians, atheists, you know, whoever. Is, and the, the, the term is in Turkish, hoşgoru, um, which usually gets translated as tolerance. So again, his most accessible wor work in English is toward a global civilization of love and tolerance. And that word tolerance is the word hoşgoru, which I was at a conference in Ghana, and Scott Alexander, who's professor of um, Muslim Christian studies at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, gave a talk on hoshguru, in which he said, literally the term means to see nicely, which is right, it's a compound word, hoshguru. But Scott said, for people of his med, it needs a theological interpretation. And he said, so what hoshguru means, this term tolerance, which is a weak term, right, in English, so I'll tolerate you, I'll put up with you, no. Hoshkaru, to see nicely, means to see others as God sees them. And Scott said, what that means is to see others with eyes of mercy and compassion, which are the most frequently used terms for God in Islam, in the Bismillah, the phrase at the beginning of every one of the chapters of the Quran. Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, the most merciful. And this is used whenever Muslims gather together as a greeting to acknowledge how we are to see each other. And so this is Gulen's principle for pluralism, is that he's a Muslim, and the people he's inspired are Muslims, but they will work with anybody toward the common good because of this principle of hoshkaru, which also, of course, requires, because we're humans, Forgiveness. <clears throat> Finally, deep peace means a way of relating to others that we can call social enterprise, and it's here probably that Gandhi and Gulen diverge the most. Gandhi had little to do with modern economics um, and um, kind of fought against it and you know, sought to kind of rebuild village um, cultures. But Gulen grew up in a village, but then lived in the biggest cities of Turkey and worked in them and got to know businessmen and helped business people, men and women, right, because he was very much an advocate for gender equality for both men and women, full education, full participation in society, again, in a ruthlessly patriarchal Turkish society. Um, and the principle here across the Gulen-inspired enterprises is the word istishara, which uh, it, it, it's a Turkish version of a, an Arabic word, shura, which means mutual consultation. And so the idea is the practice of the various enterprises associated with um, his met, bank, newspaper, relief agencies, all operate through this process of dialogue debate in which there is no hierarchy, nobody who's the expert, but where everybody's voice is welcomed, right? It's a lot like the analogy I draw in the book is to the Quakers, the way the Quakers have done business through this process of building consensus, growing consensus, because that, Gilan says, mutual consultation is as important for Muslims as prayer. All right, <clears throat> so those five paths of peace, um, education, nonviolent practices of our faith traditions, engaged empathy, principled pluralism, and social enterprise. Businesses turn towards the common good, Mohammed Yunus, here, the uh, Muslim economist, Nobel Prize winner, in his book, Creating a World Without Poverty, emphasizes the same kind of dynamic. All right, my conclusion, and then we'll have a chance to talk a little bit, and I apologize for going on, but you seem to still be with me. Am I doing okay? You still there? All right, good. Thank you <clears throat> for that. To conclude, <clears throat> What I pointed out to you are correlations, not causality, between the thought and practices of Mahatma Gandhi and the thought and practices of Fatullah Gulen and the global Hizmet community. I do not know how much Gandhi studied or read um, Gulen. I would now like to ask him that question. But both men communi communicated a hopeful vision for the world. Indeed, both were convinced that peace was not only possible, but peace was unfolding and growing in history around us. Gandhi put it this way in a letter to a US publication in 1935, and I quote, 
Not to believe in the possibility of permanent peace is to disbelieve the godliness of human nature. If the recognized leaders of humanity who have control over engines of destruction were wholly to renounce their use with full knowledge of its implications, permanent peace can be obtained. This is clearly impossible without the great powers of the earth renouncing their imperialistic design. This again seems impossible without great nations caught ceasing to believe in soul-destroying competition and to desire to multiply wants and therefore increase their material possessions. It is my conviction that the root of the evil is want of a living faith in a living God. And Gandhi then directly challenged Christians, quote, it is a first-class human tragedy that peoples of the earth who claim to believe in the message of Jesus, who they describe as the Prince of Peace, show little of that belief in actual practice. It is painful to see sincere Christian divines limiting the scope of Jesus' message to select individuals. I have been taught from my childhood and tested the truth by experience that the primary virtues of humanity are possible of cultivation by the meanest of the human species. It is this undoubted universal possibility that distinguishes the humans from the rest of God's creation. If even one great nation were unconditionally to perform the supreme act of renunciation, many of us would see in our lifetime, visible peace established on earth, end quote. May it be so. You should not be surprised by now to learn that Gulen shared a similar, if broader, vision of world, the world at peace. He wrote, our old world will experience an amazing springtime before its demise. This springtime will see the gap between rich and poor narrow, the world's riches will be distributed more justly according to work, capital, and needs. There will be no discrimination based on race, color, language, or worldview. And basic human rights and freedoms will be protected. Individuals will come to the fore and learning how to realize their potential will ascend on the way to becoming the most elevated human on the wings of love, knowledge, and belief. Yes, this springtime will rise on the foundations of love, compassion, mercy, dialogue, acceptance of other mutual respect and rights. It will be a time in which humanity will discover its real essence. Goodness and kindness, righteousness and virtue will form the basic essence of the world. No matter what happens, the world will come to this path sooner or later. Nobody can prevent this. We pray and beg that the infinitely compassionate one will not let our hopes and expectations come to nothing. End quote. And again I say, and on this I shall conclude, amen. I thank you for attention and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much. You gave us so much to think about. And uh, I just want to tell all of you, we can go a little bit longer now. Um, not too much longer, but... <laughs> We'll have a, All right. a, few, a few questions. There's a mic here and there. And because this is being recorded and we want the questions uh, to be recorded well, um, please, if you have a question, step up to one of these mics. So I have a question in your conclusion. Um, so you're saying that uh, peace is like growing and not impossible. Yep. Um, and that was from the views of another person you quoted. Along Gandhi and Gulen, both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gandhi and Gulen. Um, would you possibly argue that their views are idealistic for our world today? Yeah, I say that in the book, uh, the critical biography, I conclude that section by saying, this seems ridiculously utopian, right? When strong men seem to rule the world, when, you know, Vladimir Putin is invading Ukraine, when you have a dictator in Turkey, another one in Hungary, another one down in Brazil, Bolsonaro, when you have a wannabe dictator as president of the United States for four years. Right? I mean, I'm just being real with you about this. And yet, look to the margins and look to young people in particular who are not beholden to these same systems. And one of the books here I really like 
I think he's a, he's a terrible thinker on religion. He's just completely wrong on religion. But there's a Harvard neuropsychiatrist by the name of Steven Pinker. And his book is The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. And he tracks how, in a long perspective, compared to even 150 years ago, right, our lives are far and away the most peaceful, most comfortable, longest life expectancy, lowest infant mortality rate, greatest creature comforts ever compared to how my great-grandparents lived with their pitchforks and wooden wheelbarrows, right? Life expectancies in the 40s or 50s, maybe, right? So, <laughs> again, we have to look to the margins and see where peace is growing. And the margins are often, interestingly, where religion is growing as well. And what we tend to focus on, because unfortunately our secular media does not get religion at all, by and large, right, <clears throat> is um, we need really robust interpretation of those traditions over and against the tendency to depict them as, you know, the most violent or the greatest sources of violence in the world, which is just, excuse my French, bullshit. Compared to what nation states have done and what economic systems have done, our religious systems have consistently developed peace, reconciliation, care for one another, concern, emphasize grace, develop beautiful sacred places, music, liturgies, harmonies, etc. So we need a better interpretation of how our religions work to foster that kind of peace. And this is you know, what I'm working on and what I see. And it's basically the trajectory from, uh, from Gandhi, um, you know, intentional religious peace building, inter-religious peace building began in 1914, pretty much, with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And, and again, historically speaking, that's like nothing. And yet it's grown from Gandhi to uh, Lima Bowie. Do you know Lima Bowie? The Liberian Lutheran peace um, activist who ended a civil war in Liberia by bringing the Muslim and the Christian women of Liberia together and with nothing other than prayer. You know, they also did a sex strike, refused to have sex until the war ended. It didn't work. Nobody actually followed it, but got them a lot of press, right? Um, and you could read this in her memoir, you know, Mighty Be Our Powers, How Prayer, Sex, and Sisterhood Changed a Nation at War. Um, but it was organizing this grassroots soul force, Satyagraha truth force, right, that ended the Civil War, led to a new constitution for Liberia, and the election of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf as the first woman president of an African nation. And there are story after story after story like that that nobody knows about. How many of you know Lima Bowie's story? Two. She's a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2011. She's a person of deep faith who took her faith into public life, ended a civil war by organizing women, <laughs> right, to change the society. And this is happening in culture after culture after culture after culture, time and again. And what we need to do is get out of the silos of institutional sort of religiosity where we don't work with each other where and learn to cooperate, build new coalitions. And it, again, it's happening from the grassroots on the ground up because people are fed up with the military violence and the economic violence that continues to be a plague to our world. And the fact of the matter is, we have to work together on issues like the climate crisis or we are not going to be able to work together on anything. So there's a lot of good motivation for us to engage in peace building, this work of deep peace. Right? And um, they seem idealistic, right? and yet I think they are profoundly realistic, actually, in a way that describes a reality I want to live in. Anyway, right? OK, another question? Please. You're welcome. Great question. I know it's sort of the natural one. You know, what about the terrible people in the world and that sort of thing, right? But yeah, others? How many of you are in doc one of Dr. Besky's classes? Good. Nice bunch. I'll see you all tomorrow morning then. <laughs> as well, but please, others, I'd love dialogue. Go ahead. Yep, I understand. Hi. Hi. Does this work? Yes, it works. I'm a re... This guy is at the microphone a lot. He's a musician. My ah, son, my, hey, my son in law. Um, I'm a retired teacher from Texas, mm. and I moved here because my daughter married him after I retired, yeah. but you mentioned the public schools, 
and uh, they're in such a mess, especially in Texas, but not only. Yeah. But I managed to get myself in trouble a lot, but the kids and the parents were usually on my side, and I survived. You talk about the sex strike. Yes. I taught the Greek play uh, where the women uh -huh. go on strike. Uh, yes. I'm not sure how to say it. Lysistrata? Lysistrata, yeah, of course. This is and where, uh, yeah. Spike Lee has done a modern version of it called Chirac. <laughs> but, uh, and it's, Schools? Now they're banning books. Oh, yeah, yeah. And what, how can we fight that? Mm. Um, by teaching those books, by reading those books, by buying those books. Um, and surviving your job. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I mean, I, 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 one of the talks I've done in, uh, many times is clashing minorities, converging majorities. Right? I mean, there are very loud and vocal minorities from our religious traditions especially. And here, you know, I'm going to call out my own Protestant siblings, um, you know, the evangelical community especially. Anthea Butler's book, White Evangelical Racism, puts it very clearly that this kind of anti-intellectual racism is based on a white supremacist ideology that is not accidental to evangelicalism, but is at, at its very heart and has been all along. The same is true of... Uh, other fundamentalist evangelical movements that date to the 19th century. They like to claim they're the old time religion. Well, no. There are modern innovations from the late 19th, early 20th century. You know, all of this sort of anti intellectualism, anti science. I mean, it was evolution that was the first issue. But that's a minority of our siblings in Christ. Um, and so those of us who um, share a different perspective, who want robust, critical uh, public education, strong schools, have to advocate with the same kind of intensity that we have found in uh, coming from these minority groups. Can, can I so. bring up one more thing? Sure. Um, I always did a study or a celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday. Sure. Even before it was a holiday, I would play Stevie Wonder's song, uh, Happy, birthday, Happy Birthday, before that happened. Yeah. And... Um, um, even after it finally became a holiday, uh -huh. and I could DVR, <laughs> I, I taped a celebration from PBS okay. where one of those civil rights leaders, I can't remember which one, Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, talked about not being able to try on clothes in a department store. Sure. And remember, I'm in Texas, evangelical, you know, yep. and one of my white football players, big old redneck football player, said, what? Yeah. They couldn't try, what? I mean, blacks couldn't try on clothes? Yep. No. So, and that's the kind of history that they, these right. others don't want them to know about. Critical race theory is yeah. accurate history, period. <laughs> I mean, let's just put that out there for you all. Thank you very much for your comments and questions. Just a, com a comment about uh, Stevie, Stevie Wonder. I saw him in concert in Cobo Hall um, the night before he went to Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress. Um, for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And I can say, I mean, the last song he did was Happy Birthday. And one by one, the musicians left the stage. And the entire hall was singing the chorus along with him. And then somebody came and helped Stevie off the stage. And we all kept singing out until we got in our cars. And I knew that night there was going to be a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday because of that music, that soul force expressed in this liturgy of hope and praise. So anyway, maybe that's where we'll end. Yeah. I'm, I'm confident that we could go on for a long time, but we did advertise it to be one hour. We yep. went a little bit over. I just, right. I, I just can't tell you how grateful I am that you have surpassed my high expectations, and I trust everybody else is here. I want to again thank Tolga. He put me on to you, and I'm, I'm immensely grateful for that, as I trust every one of you here is as well. Thank you. Thanks all for coming. Thank you for being here.